Good day and welcome to Blueprint for Clean Energy, a webinar speaker series hosted by the Yale Center for Business and the Environment. My name is Olga Kachuk and I will be your host for today's webinar titled Transportation ESCOs, Increasing Adoption of Electric Vehicle Fleets. The Blueprint for Clean Energy webinar series invites leading practitioners and researchers in the field of clean energy to talk about the latest opportunities and developments in corporate, nonprofit, and public-private arenas. In today's webinar, we will explore the potential for ESCO business models to accelerate integration and adoption of electric vehicles into fleet operations with our speakers, Justine Sears and Jennifer Wallace-Berger. Justine is a consultant in Vermont Energy Corporation's Transportation Efficiency Division. At VEIC, her work has focused on the environmental and economic impacts of transportation policies. She has led comprehensive transportation cost benefit analyses for the National Association of State Energy Offices and forecasting efforts for a range of transportation and energy planning projects. As director of BEIC's Transportation Efficiency Group, Jennifer Wallace-Berger oversees a staff of consulting professionals and manages the department's operation. For over 20 years, she has successfully led teams to advance program and policy solutions on a range of issues at the national, state, and local level. She has extensive experience on active transportation, land issues, and mobility issues for older adults. Before we begin, we would like to remind our listeners that we welcome any questions you might have and we'll direct them to our speakers towards the end of the talk. Please type questions directly into the Q&A window throughout the presentation. And with that, Justine and Jennifer, welcome to Blueprint for Clean Energy. Thank you. We're gonna load up the slides now. So just hold on one second. Sure, no problem. Okay, all right, I think we're ready to go. So this is Jennifer, I'm very glad to be here with you. And I'm gonna introduce our organization and our prime speaker, Justine. So as Olga said, I'm the director of Vermont Energy Investment Corporation's Transportation Efficiency Group. And the Vermont Energy Investment Corporation is a mission-driven nonprofit organization that was formed about 30 years ago. Our mission is to reduce the environmental and economic impact of transportation, um, of energy use, um, both in buildings and in transportation. Um, we are uh, internationally recognized for advancing energy efficiency, conservation, and renewable energy plans and projects. And we work both in building efficiency, re uh, renewable energy, and transportation. Um, we are well known as the contractor for Efficiency Vermont, which was the nation's first and leading uh, energy efficiency utility. And we also hold utility scale contracts um, for energy efficiency work in the District of Columbia and Ohio. Um, about five years ago, VEIC formed a transportation group, really in response and acknowledging the fact that transportation was the number one source of greenhouse gas emissions, at least in our state of Vermont. Um, uh, and, and now, um, as of last year, uh, transportation is now the number one emitter of greenhouse gas emissions as a sector in the United States. So clearly, if we were going to have an, uh, be able to address um, the environmental impacts of, um, of energy use, um, we really needed to tackle transportation. So our group works on, to advance solutions um, that improve access to jobs and services for um, disadvantaged populations, and we also work to advance um, more efficient, cleaner vehicles, and particularly uh, electric vehicles. Um, today we're going to talk about a model that we've been looking at that could help finance the transition to more efficient um, uh, fleets, uh, particularly light-duty fleets. Um, and Justine is going to um, uh, take it from here to explain our work in that area and, and this particular model. And we look forward to your questions at the end. That's us. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jen. 
So well, the title of this talk is Using Energy Efficiency Finance Models to Electrify Fleets. And specifically, we'll be talking about the ESCO model or the energy services company model. And traditional ESCOs are generally for profits. They can be not for profits and they provide financing for building efficiency projects. So under an ESCO model, the ESCO provides upfront capital for efficiency upgrades, and then the loan is, used, is paid off using the energy savings. So on this slide, the first yellow circle represents the building's energy costs before entering into an ESCO contract. The second circle shows the building costs while under contract, so their energy costs have been reduced, they're paying off their loan using those savings, leaving some left over for positive cash flow. And by the end of the contract period, the loan's paid off and they're able to realize all of the financial savings. So ESCOs generally provide wraparound services, not just financing. So they provide initial consulting, they oversee installation of any new technologies, and then they also finance projects. So it's really the neat model where financing provides access to efficient technologies in a revenue neutral or even a revenue positive way. And in 2013, DEIC launched Commons Energy, which is a public purpose ESCO that finances efficiency projects for public purpose buildings like schools um, or churches that are usually not served by the traditional ESCO market that generally focuses on large commercial and manufacturing buildings. Um, so the launch of Commons really got us thinking about how an ESCO-like model could be applied to promote efficient technologies within transportation. So today we'll be exploring how this model can provide, uh, providing upfront capital for efficient technologies could be applied to fleets and what kind of new financing models might make sense for electric vehicles and charging infrastructure. So electric vehicles have a higher sticker price than conventional vehicles, but they also require less maintenance and they're cheaper to fuel, which can result in a total lower cost, a lower cost of ownership overall. So a transportation ESCO would be based on a total cost of ownership model. So the ESCO would provide upfront capital for electric vehicles and fueling infrastructure, and the loan would be paid off to the lower cost of vehicle ownership. So we saw transportation ESCO or TESCO as a way to move the electric vehicle market to reduce cost and a way to reduce cost for fees. So there's three key ways that we see a TESCO providing value to clients. Um, first, providing a finance mechanism that leverages that lower total cost of ownership of EVs. Second, a way to optimize integration of EVs into fleets, and that's through the, the consulting on the front end. And then finally, there's some potential to make bulk purchases of EVs and bring down vehicle prices. So we're exploring applica application of this model to both light duty fleet markets, so for plug-in hybrid and all electric vehicles, and also the heavy duty market. So that would include transit buses and school buses. So over the past few years, we've been developing a Tesco framework. Um, initially, we held a series of focus, group with, focus groups with fleet managers in Vermont to learn about their fleet operations, what sort of ESCO services they would be interested in, um, as well as to learn about their attitudes <coughs> towards EVs more generally. Um, to know if they considered plug-in vehicles, did they think they were too expensive or inconvenient, were they aware of the range of models that were available. Um, we also completed some fleet assessments and some financial modeling, and I'll get to those in, in later slides. But, uh, so I'll touch more on the, I think I talked, yeah, so I'll speak more about the fleet assessments now, or the focus groups now. Um, so through our focus groups, we ended up interacting with about 40 different organizations, universities, and businesses, and three teams emerged, um, a strong interest in medium duty vehicles. So these would include vans, service vehicles, like those that are used by telephone and cable companies, smaller delivery vehicles, and the EV market just isn't ready to meet that demand yet. So there are some medium duty EVs out there, but they're just not widely commercially available, um, certainly not the way, that, the way that light duty EVs are. So this will probably change in the coming years, but for now, um, we're, going to be, we're focusing on light duty vehicles. Um, so we also heard strong interest in green fleets, so repeatedly our participants expressed a desire to get off of fossil fuels and transition to cleaner energy. If only the option was available, if it was easy to understand, and if it was cost effective. 
Um, so for a lot of the fleet managers that we talked to, it was just too overwhelming for them to wrap their heads around installing a charging station and determining how many charging stations they needed or figuring out which vehicle would work for them. And that's really what we're trying to address with the Tesco. We want it to be easy and affordable for fleets to electrify. And we saw real interest and demand for that type of service. We're not certain if we've been disconnected from the. It looks like maybe your slides aren't sharing right now. Okay. Um, can we use your? It looks like I. Uh... I'm happy to open them up for you as well. Yeah, okay, that, that would, would be, be great. Do you have okay, you, yeah, you should, yeah. just one second then everybody? So so can you sign on so I can follow along? Did she send you the oh, if you want to jump back in? Okay. Yeah, we're trying we're for whatever reasons, um, Justine I lost, my lost internet. her internet connection. Oh, okay, no worries. <laughs> we'll just hang on Sorry. there. Um, Olga, can you send us uh, the meeting invite so we can get back into the meeting? Sure, yeah, one second. Have you sent that, Olga? Yep, you should be able to jump back in now. Okay, got it. Just got it. Okay, we're back in. Thank you. No problem. Go ahead. All right. Thanks, Olga. Um, so we were just going over the focus groups. Um, so we saw a lot of interest in greening fleets from fleet managers, and 
finally, we encountered mixed feelings about financing. So most fleets that we spoke with purchased their vehicles outright, and engaging with a Tesco or a Tesco type model would require fundamental changes to how they acquire their vehicles. And I think there, we are seeing some movement and change there. Um, at least a few municipalities that we know of are switching over to financing rather than purchasing vehicles. So that is certainly a step in the right direction as, as for this model as far as this goes. Oh yeah, that's right. So you, next slide. Um, so the fleet assessments that we did were performed in partnership with the Canadian company Fleet Karma. Uh, so Fleet Karma uses a three-step approach to integrating EVs into fleets. Uh, first, they log vehicles to gather baseline data related to vehicle trip characteristics, daily mileage, duty cycle, fuel usage, things like that. Uh, they run the data that they've gathered through a series of models to determine if there is an electric model that could perform this vehicle's duty cycle, and if a switch to an EV would actually save the fleet any money. So there's usually a minimum number of miles that need to be driven in order for an EV to pay itself off. And then finally, a report's generated that summarizes EV suitability and potential savings for each vehicle. Next slide. So we engaged with three participants in the fleet assessments, a nonprofit and two municipal fleets. We logged a total of 21 vehicles for approximately one month. Next slide. And this is an example of some of the data that we gathered. So this is a figure of daily utilization. So we see here that this vehicle gets a high amount of use during the day, so there'd be relatively little opportunity to charge except at night. Next slide. In contrast, this vehicle is hardly used at all, could just be cut entirely from the fleet. Next slide. And then finally, this vehicle that looks like it's in constant use, but was in fact idling almost 60% of the time, and idling is another form of inefficiency that can be addressed through a fleet assessment. Next slide. So all of this information feeds into a report that details whether an EV model is range capable, what the energy savings would be if the vehicle was swapped out, the emission savings, and estimated cost. So this analysis really allows fleets to estimate the total cost of ownership of each vehicle, accounting for fuel and maintenance, in addition to the vehicle price. And it's by optimizing that total cost of ownership that fleets can realize savings. Next slide. And finally, all of these savings are summed and aggregated to estimate the total financial and emission savings that would be achieved if all of the fleet's inefficiencies were addressed and the proposed recommendations were implemented. So these recommendations can include fleet right sizing, so reducing the overall number of vehicles integrated. Um, in the fleet, integrating EVs, and reducing idling. So I won't be produce, presenting any specific results from the fleet assessments that we performed to protect the privacy of the organizations that participated, but I can share that inefficiencies were found in all the fleets um, that we worked with, and for all of them, there were opportunities for right-sizing as well as vehicle upgrades to EVs. And the range of savings that we saw, even just logging a few vehicles, was between $8,000 and about $25,000 over the course of a seven-year vehicle lifespan. Next slide. So the Tesco design, as we see it, is very similar to a traditional ESCO model. It follows closely the steps that we took in developing this framework. So Tesco services would start with a fleet assessment, similar to a building energy audit, to gather baseline data and identify inefficiencies within the fleets, as well as solutions that can minimize overall cost and environmental impact. Um, so that would include working with fleets to identify suitable plug-in vehicles that will meet their needs. And of course, looking at all electric plug-in hybrid models, um, assessing charging infrastructure needs. The Tesco would provide technical assistance to facilitate the proposed changes, whether that's overseeing installation of charging stations, acquiring vehicles, um, creating a platform to share vehicles after right sizing happens. And finally, project financing. And because we haven't launched yet, we're still in the space of figuring out what that financing is going to look like. Uh, it could vary quite a bit depending on the size of the fleet and the length of the contract. Next slide. So the final piece of our work was the financial modeling. Um, so we found a lot of interest in Tesco services on the part of fleets, but we're still determining what sort of structure makes the most sense from um, a business standpoint. 
So in order to work at Tesco, we need to provide clients guaranteed savings, be they financial or fuel savings. And um, to some extent, those savings would be used to pay off investments in more efficient vehicles. So we looked at a variety of models. We looked at leasing and purchasing vehicles. Um, we also explored a different combination of savings. And through our fleet assessments, we saw that financial savings come primarily from right sizing and fuel savings. So in our modeling, we looked at how much right sizing we, need, we would need to do, how much fuel we would need to save in order to achieve a positive return on investment. So that led us to the third bullet you see here, which is that fleet size matters and composition. So larger fleets provide more opportunities for savings through right sizing. They also offer larger economies of scale and older, less efficient fleets are obviously provide more opportunities for savings as well. Uh, it's also worth noting that attitude is important. So to some extent, the ideal Tesco client is one with an inefficient fleet. So there's a lot of room for improvement, opportunities to, to realize savings, but also a client that's open to innovation and changing their practices. So in our models, the agreement between the Tesco and the client was based on a price per mile. So customers would pay the Tesco a flat mileage rate, and that would include everything, vehicle maintenance, insurance, charging infrastructure. So that aspect of fleet management would become the task of the Tesco rather than the client. Next slide. And I'll just mention very briefly the Indianapolis <coughs> fleet, which uh, was an, an initiative that the city had undertaken in partnership with a for-profit company called Vision Fleet. And this is no longer up and running, this project, but um, it's worth noting here because Vision Fleet was using a total cost of ownership model to help the city's fleet transition to EVs. And it was very similar to an ESCO and the Tesco as, as we described it. Next slide. So the, the way that the Freedom Fleet worked was Vision Fleet came in, they did a fleet analysis, they right-sized the fleet, um, they determined which vehicles could be swapped out for plug-in vehicles, and they created a car sharing platform for the city. Um, they purchased and maintained the vehicles, they oversaw installation of charging infrastructure, and they um, negotiated a price per mile. So they charged the city based on, on a price per mile. Uh, and then they actively monitored how much driving and charging was done. And that price per mile was, or that agreement was based on a mileage floor. So the city was guaranteed a certain level of savings if they drove a, a minimum amount. And as I said, this, uh, the Freedom Fleet is no longer active and Vision Fleet in fact has, um, they are no longer active either as a company. They tried a few different business models, um, but we see, total cost of ownership and that approach to fleet management as being very promising. So our hope is to continue to explore that idea, especially with municipal fleets who aren't able to claim the federal tax credit. Next slide. So some of the key findings from our work thus far, uh, we think the timing is right. So in the next year, more extended range EVs are expected to be coming on the market. Um, a Tesco model would require fleet managers to adopt new ways of acquiring vehicles. So we mentioned that fleets would need to be open to financing. Um, and we are seeing a shift there. Um, we saw that fleet conversions work by correcting inefficiencies plus integrating EVs. So in the three fleets that we worked with, right sizing, it was a combination of right sizing and integrating plug-in vehicles that achieved a positive ROI. But Plugins on their own were not enough, and at least in the fleets that we look, looked at, to, to have a positive payback. Um, and then finally, the, the key Tesco value propositions as we see them are first and foremost, leveraging long-term fuel savings through, through a performance contract, um, coordinating bulk purchases, and providing consulting services to optimize EV integration into fleets. Next slide. So we can just touch on some of the financial resources that we came upon or researched further in our work um, that could be paired with a Tesco model or Tesco financing to make a stronger financial case for fleet conversions. Um, these include state infra infrastructure banks, which are not available in all states, but most states do have, have SIBs, state infrastructure banks, and usually EV charging is a um, 
an eligible measure under them. Um, there are temporary incentives for light duty electric vehicles that varies by state. There's also the federal tax incentive that's available. There are federal grants for medium and heavy duty EVs. There's the Diesel Reduction Act grants or DERA grants that are available through the EPA and the Low No Emission Program through the Federal Transit Administration. So those would be for um, primarily probably for transit buses and they could be paired with Tesco financing. And then finally, there are VD, VW settlement funds. Um, do you want to add anything about VW? Yeah, um, what I would add is that everybody should be aware that um, VW settled um, the lawsuit filed by EPA in the uh, state of California um, and multiple states um, for emission violations. Um, and so um, there, Every state that was a party to that is going to be receiving funds um, likely um, over, towards the end of the year. But the upshot is every state is going to designate a beneficiary and need to write a plan for how they, they intend to deploy the funds from that settlement. Um, vehicles that there are 10 um, eligible categories that outline the vehicles that would be eligible. Um, and essentially, um, you can swap out old diesel vehicles for cleaner. Um, fueled vehicles, including electric, um, propane, natural gas, um, and other cleaner technologies. So um, uh, it's important to note that uh, vehicles such as school buses, uh, transit buses, freight trucks, and other um, types of vehicles are eligible um, for upgrades, and, um, and every state will need to write a plan for how they intend to use the money to uh, reduce NOx emissions and deploy those funds uh, for cleaner vehicles. So um, if you aren't aware of this, I would just highly suggest that you um, uh, get aware of what's happening in your state around this. The one caveat that I would mention is that um, light duty vehicles are not included um, as eligible vehicles, but charging infrastructure is an eligible activity. Up to 15% of a state's allocation can be used for electric, um, for uh, charging infrastructure. So again, I would just put that on the radar for folks to get aware of um, and uh, to try to follow what's happening in your state with this. All right, thank you. Um, next slide. So some of the future opportunities that we are exploring is how we could serve underserved markets. So those that may not traditionally have access to efficient technologies, EVs in particular, um, tend to be a higher income item. We'd be interested in making those more accessible. Um, how can a Tesco address fleet inefficiencies more broadly? And we talked about that a bit. It's not just about plug-in vehicles in terms of reducing energy use and greenhouse gas emissions, but also right-sizing fleets. Um, we also spent quite a bit of time exploring how a Tesco could be adapted to replace employee mileage reimbursement programs. And we haven't yet found a business model that makes sense for that, but it's um, an active area of research. And finally, how does the Tesco model make sense for transit fleets and other heavy duty markets? And we touched on that a bit. It's probably gonna be a combination of um, bringing multiple funding and financing mechanisms together. Because the, in some ways transit vehicles or heavy duty vehicles are um, excellent candidates for Tesco because they they are so much more expensive that it, it makes a lot of sense to finance them but it also the incremental cost difference is is still a big barrier that needs, that needs to be overcome next slide oh and I think that's it for us so we are open to questions Olga, I don't know if there was anything you wanted to add. Uh, sure, yeah, there's quite a few questions that have come in, so um, let's just dive into the Q&A. So the first question uh, is, uh, do lifetime savings include costs of installing charging infrastructure? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> that was an easy <laughs> question. <laughs> um, and then we also- Which are obviously- Go ahead. Variable by site. So, so those costs are, the, the equipment isn't that expensive, the installation costs can be um, very expensive in some cases, very cheap in others, so it's variable. Um, 
So we just use in that we, we have quite a bit of information and data on that that we've been tracking. So we use an average. Okay, great. And how do you see the rapid evolution of battery technology and the falling costs of raw materials impacting the adoption and financing of EVs? Yeah, so I mean for I know that gas prices are low, but for us we I guess it's um, we see advancements in battery technology as very promising. I think the vehicle prices are only going to come down. So I think that the EV market is only going to grow stronger. So if you want to add anything to that. Uh, what has been your experience with uh, heavy-duty EV fleets in other industries, so mining, for instance? Oh, so we have we've really only had experience with school buses and transit buses, which are just now. I mean, both of those are pretty new technologies. We have school mm -hmm. buses on the road in Massachusetts, and. Um, there are an increasing number of transit buses okay. on the road as well, but those are those are still, you know, in, in pilot and demo mode. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, jumping back a little bit to the focus groups, could you tell us more about the participants, uh, what geographies they represent, and uh, mm -hmm. whether they were proponents of electric vehicles? Yeah. So they were a really wide range. They um, the nature we had a funding through a foundation and. So the, the nature of that funding was that we had to focus most of our work in Vermont. Um, so it, we, had, um, we had a participant from Maine, but for the most part it was fleets in Vermont and a really wide range of organizations, um, quite a few colleges and universities, private businesses, nonprofits, municipalities, state agencies. Um, so a, mix, a mixture of for-profit and not-for-profit and really a mix mixture of EV proponents and um, those who were highly suspicious of them and those who were completely disinterested. Um, and we didn't pitch the focus group so much as, um, as EV specific, more as um, we were interested in talking to fleet managers about their thoughts on greening their fleets more generally to, you know, to include aspects of right sizing. Um, and with the, so for the, these were light duty fleets, but some, some of those fleets included heavy duty, or we had some, we just ended up interacting a bit with some of the heavy duty fleets. And diesel, I guess, is such a, can be so difficult to, it's so hard on, on vehicles and the, the regulations are becoming more stringent that the, the heavy duty fleet managers were very, very interested in transitioning away, but they, we just don't have a cost-effective option at this point. And I think um, EVs are getting there. Maybe are getting, certainly there are improvements, but um, so it's kind of a, I don't know, it was sort of this mismatch in the, where, where there's demand and where the technology or where the market is. Great. So the, the light duty, the light duty offerings are there. It's a little mm -hmm. bit less demand because those vehicles are less troublesome, less expensive. And then with heavy duty, a ton of demand on the part of fleet managers, but um, just no real alternatives for them to, to use at this point. Great, thank you. And then we have another question on contract length. So for traditional ESCOs, uh, legislation often limits contract length to a period that's less than the efficiency measure life. So in your modeling, what did you assume for the contract length? So we looked at, um, three and seven year models. So three years being a lease and then seven years being the, a relatively short vehicle lifespan. Um, and that was, that was something that um, was a hindrance. I, the, the longer term models perform better for sure from a, a financial return standpoint. Um, and I know that I've dug in a little bit to to some of that, that legislation, it get, you know, varies by state and it, it can be limiting. Um, and that might um, guide where we do our work, um, which I think since we're just getting off the ground, that's fine to, to be able to target our work based on geography and based on where legislation is a little bit more um, open. 
Great. Um, we have another question that's about redundancy. So there are cases where redundancy is needed in a fleet to address, um, you know, any unexpected or emergency conditions, and a lack of the required redundancy could um, potentially have economic and customer satisfaction issues. So how has this needed redundancy been taken into consideration when uh, determining appropriate fleet sizing? Yeah, that that is a great question. So we. Um, it's true, a computer algorithm is not going to tell you everything about real world conditions. So we the, um, we would gather all of this data and we worked with Fleet Karma and they spit out rec models and recommendations and then those, you go over those with the fleet managers who have a good sense of um, how often something unexpected comes up. Um, and I think also the the longer your fleet assessment is, obviously, the, the more information you can gather and you um, have a better sense of that you just, it paints a, a clearer picture of what your actual needs and duty cycles are. So the, the shorter your, if you, you know, only log a vehicle or log a fleet for a few weeks, you're going to miss seasonal variations or, um, that, you know, you, you're not even giving yourself time to have any unexpected events. So I think we certainly see the need for some redundancy, but I think it's fair to say that most fleets could do with some right sizing and have few um, negative consequences of that. They would really just save money. Okay, got it. Great. Um, are Tesco Ventures considering the revenue streams that an electric fleet could generate by providing grid stability or any sort of storage capacity or energy delivery to local utilities or demand reduction for the host facility? Yes, that's a great question. So initially when we started this work, that was, um, that was a hope, was that we were going to kind of uh, put together this value proposition that included not just the energy savings, but, you know, environmental credit markets and grid services and um, the, the energy markets just are not there yet. That's um, an active area of research for us. We've done a lot of work there and it, we're just not at the point where EVs can be selling into those markets. And, um, so we, while we can look at it on, on a th theoretical basis, we couldn't include it in any of our modeling because it's, it's too many years out. So it's definitely on our radar and we see that as a real value that we can bring both environmentally, financially, in terms of grid stability, um, but we just can't, we can't include it in our models yet. Quickly. Great. Um, and in what respects do you anticipate the Tesco model will be competitive or offer value that's um, perhaps superior to uh, manufacturer fleet sales, such as those long offered by uh, General Motors or Ford or other uh, organizations? All right. Well, I mean, our hope uh, to some extent is that we can coordinate bulk buys across with either with large customers or across multiple customers. And that I think is definitely a work in progress. Um, so that would be one way that one value add that Tesco would bring. But also the, I mean, really the key value proposition is using those energy savings to, to bring down the upfront cost. And so it's not just financing, but it's financing that is being paid off through energy savings. Um, which we have yet to see in transportation yet, other than in Indianapolis with Vision Fleet, which is no longer active. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about your engagement with uh, green or infrastructure banks? Are they more interested in financing charging stations that can be accessed by uh, many people? Yes. I, uh, it, I'm sure it varies by state, but most of those the SIBs that I know of require, they often require the charging to be public or open to the public, not free necessarily, but um, open to the public. Great. Uh, what do you think about this model working or maybe not working for federal fleets, um, specifically given the obstacles that they face around uh, what are usually very prescriptive replacement cycles? Right. Um, I think there's some potential. I know that Vision Fleet was 
was trying to engage with federal fleets. Um, and I think that's, that's a problem not unique to federal, federal fleets. That's also common in, in state fleets as well. Um, and yeah, I think it's good. It's just going to take a, a shift in thinking, which is, which we're seeing certainly at the municipal level. Um, and if the, I think if the, the, the case can be made for, um, the financial case, if that case can be strong enough, then I think we'll start to make progress in that realm. Great, thank you. Uh, could you comment a little bit more broadly on any policy conditions that are favorable for um, for this kind of model? Um, generally? Or maybe more so anything specific that you've seen that has been um, has been helpful in getting the model off the ground? Well, the vehicle incentives definitely help because they bring the, the I mean, the, the largest barrier is a, is a high upfront cost that is not always um, recoverable if you're not driving enough miles. Um, but it's, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time. Well, the federal tax credit yeah, is actually, yeah. um, in some cases, it's difficult for public fleets to take advantage of that yeah. federal tax credit. Credit. Um, and so in, the, in that case, the TEPCO can actually yeah. help them realize to actually um, take advantage of that. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and then just a clarifying question uh, that's come in. Uh, what, uh, what portion of the savings comes only from transitioning? Uh, or do you have a sense of the portion of the savings that comes from transitioning the fleet to electric vehicles versus actual fleet reduction? So it really de depends on the fleet. Um, and like one of the fleets that we looked at was quite efficient already. They And so the... So most of their savings came from right sizing, um, whereas other fleets, where if you're swapping out an older, less efficient vehicle, the, the energy savings will be more. Um, so it, it really depends on the fleet. But in, in the cases that we looked at, um, I would say half to, a little, to more than half of the savings were coming from right sizing. Great, thank you. And just to sort of um, wrap things up for our audience, uh, since we're getting close to time, what would you say are some of the, the major challenges for industry adoption of cleaner vehicle fleets? You know, if you had to sort of zoom out to a broader view of, of, um, of this work. All right. Um, well, it, I mean, vehicle price, absolutely. They are not yet quite cost competitive with conventional vehicles and i think that combined with um, concerns related to range vehicle range even with i mean you avoid those to some extent with plug-in hybrids but i think it's kind of a combination of price and um, range anxiety or kind of this almost this imperfect product make fleet managers um, not quite ready to to take the leap and a, a lot of the folks that i talked to were so positive, you know, they're kind of like, all right, just call me in five years when you got it all figured out. And, the, you know, these things have been on the road for years and they're tested. So there was a lot of, um, I think, just hesitation to, to try a new technology and to invest too much in it. Um, and the, that, I think, is, is, again, something that's just going to get easier and easier with time as we have more EV models on the road and people see them go through the winter. And um, yeah, so that's, I think of a problem that is going to kind of solve itself in a sense as we as we just get more used to the technology as a society. Right, right. That makes sense. Well, it looks like we're out of time for today. Uh, this concludes our talk on transportation ESCOs, increasing adoption of electric vehicle fleets. Uh, Justine and Jennifer, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, we also want to thank, thank the audience for all your questions and for bearing with us uh, through some technical difficulties. Uh, we will forward any remaining questions to our speaker and 
If you'd like to view a recording of this webinar, you can always visit the events tab on the Yale Center for Business and the Environment website, or you can access the recording through the Yale iTunes University podcast. Thanks again for joining us. Until next time, this is Olga Kachuk from the Yale Center for Business and the Environment.